Okay, we are live with Phoebe. Phoebe, we want to introduce yourself and then I'll talk a little bit about the class and also, I guess, introduce myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Phoebe Esmond. I am a, uh, well, I'm the bar director for Perfectly Ad Hoc Hospitality in Asheville, North Carolina. We're in the process of reopening and opening about four places. So, Life's, life's gotten really interesting in the last couple of months. And, in a, you know, well, life's gotten interesting for all of us in the last couple of months. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's what I am. That's who I am. Uh, I like to make- That's who you are. I like, I like to make people happy. That's, 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 that's it for me. Amazing. I feel like we all have that in common. Uh, my name oh. is Jessamine McClough. The Academy lead for Campari America basically just means I'm the education guru for the company and I run our physical space in New York, but I also do a lot of work on our digital education. Uh, anyway, I love learning. I love teaching. And so this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to share our, uh, our love through this platform. Um, and today we are going to be doing a pretty amazing class. It's something that I have like taught a version of this myself. Phoebe and I were actually talking about how it's it's not a new idea, but it's a really great idea. And I think a, a, a super simple way of breaking down cocktails. But today we're going to be doing the Mothers of Invention, which is the eight, maybe questionable eight, <laughs> foundational <laughs> mixed drink recipes. Um, I don't know if you want to open with that story that you just told me, Phoebe. I thought that was really funny um, for those people as they're joining. But I, I don't know. I, th I think I think I might hold on to that one for uh, for the end. But I uh, I okay. wanted to talk sort of like you know it's a good it's a good climax to this to this performance. Yeah. Um, uh, also, you know, the person responsible could actually be in the room at the moment. So, um, <laughs> uh, well, I tell me to... about how you came up with this idea and and what the thought process is behind it. Um. So I was. I used to live in, I lived in Philadelphia for a long time and um, I was driving, I was driving around Philadelphia doing something and I work, I worked with a lot of chefs there. I love to work with kitchens and, uh, and to sort of maximize everyone's potential by sharing information and ingredients. And um, I was thinking about mother sauces, the five mother sauces, because I had just bought the Julia Child, Julia Child's first cookbook, the, you know, the one. And um, I, you know, had a brain, you know, a brainstorm. I was like, well, why can't we, it would be great if we could do a class. If there were, if there were a way to teach cocktail design, like by using mother sauces, because that's such a great name, you know, because sauce. Um, but, uh, as I started to work on it, I realized uh, that there, you know, that it didn't work because there's more than five. Um, so, um, so uh, then we had seven. Uh, so Christian and I started, Christian was my fiance and partner in life and crime. And uh, we started uh, working on this idea I had because I was going to teach it at Portland Cocktail Week. And um, it's kept expanding. So then it was six, and then it was seven, and then when we hit on seven, I was like, I think that I think I think that's it, you know, seven. And then we had a good name for the seven, and then, you know, like then we had an argument uh, about Negronis, and then we were like, no, there's eight. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it keeps growing. I, I think I think we've had arguments had about Negronis. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's hilarious though, because like we were teaching some classes on, uh, on Amaro and like, you know, cocktail, like using Amaro and cocktails and stuff like that last summer. And we ended up like talking of like basically arguing with people. It was a pleasant argument. Like it was a discussion. It was an animated discussion about Negronis for almost an hour of the class. It was just like everyone, we all have opinions about things like that you're going to hear mine today um but the reason that i like these i i like this idea is like when i read a when i read a cocktail list i usually i see you know i read through it and i'm like and i kind of in my head i'm like that's a con that's a collins that's a you know that's a fancy sour 
that's an old fashioned, that's a Manhattan, regardless of like, however, how, how Baroque that drink is. Like I kind of, I, I read it and I look at how it's presented and I figure out, you know, my brain automatically just goes there. And I feel like it's a valuable tool for us. Like I'm going to get nerdy for nerdier for a moment and quote Robert Frost. Um, anyone who's heard me talk about cocktail design will have heard me say this before. Um, <laughs> Robert Frost uh, describes freedom as moving easy in harness. So he's describing like a horse harnessed to a wagon and how the horse doesn't feel bound by the, by the strictures of the, um, of the harness that he's wearing in as, in as much as he's found freedom in it. He's not thinking about it. So the way I think about cocktail design at this point, and it could change because we're all changing and growing and whatever, but I think of it as when I'm, th when I'm building a list, I think, well, there are things that I always want on my list because there are things that people always will, will want to have. Like you, I always want to put some variation on a Negroni on my list, but I, or a variation on a, or a, a margarita, you know, like, so you always want to put, have some sort of margarita on your list. It's not necessarily going to be your classic margarita. Maybe, you know, maybe you've switched out modifier or whatever. And like the, the beauty of knowing history and sort of the the families of cocktails is that you have the freedom at that point once you understand the measure the you know the various amounts of everything that goes into everything like you can play with that and that's the freedom like that's where your creativity thrives and grows yeah so i always kind of joke yes, that you have Robert. to you well i think a lot of people say this that you have to learn the classics before you can like write your own hits right that is always that association of knowing not necessarily classic cocktails but just more like the almost the dna or like the anatomy of them is understanding that so that you can you know write your own hits right and so like uh lots of people you know don't bother there i won't i won't make a blanket statement there are many people who haven't bothered um and you know sometimes their their design reflects that um because we're not really re we're not inventing new things in as much as we're reinventing things that have been around for a long time and i just want to give i didn't get my bibliography written because i overbooked myself this week and i wanted to put it into the document but i didn't get it done um but you know two things two books to look at uh you know gary regan beat us all to the punch on this because he, uh, you know, wrote the joy of mixology a long time ago and, uh, and then re-released it right before he passed. May he rest in peace. And, um, Alex Day, the same year that I was teaching this class and working on it, working on writing it and everything, um, uh, came out with the cocktail codex with this, which is a similar, you know, and it's a similar aesthetic to design. So, um, so those are two books to look at if you haven't already, but you, but I imagine that most of, most of our audience, uh, has one or both. So, um, I guess we should get started, right? On the thing. Yeah, let's so, get started. I was going to say, I actually have uh, my joy of mixology right here. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the new one? Is that the one that came out? It's the, it's the old recently? one. Yeah. Um, I haven't actually gotten my copy of the new one yet either. Um, so, uh, so, uh, where to start? So we'll start with the first, like the oldest thing that we know was technically a cocktail is the peg or highball, um, which was, um, which is really a combination of something strong with something weaker in order to, you know, make a more sort of a longer, more sessionable drink. So uh, if you're following along in the notes, I'm, I'm going to try not to like read straight off of the handout. Um, and I think that the more interesting discussion is in the, uh, is sort of in where we take uh, the, the design themselves. But I did make these uh, lovely, uh, these lovely, I told you I was going to do this, Jessamyn. Um, this lo these lovely. <laughs> I'm so glad you did this. Little, uh, <laughs> There, can you well, see it? The other yeah, way, yes, go. perfect. <laughs> um, awesome. So, uh, 
that's my little visual aid there. Um, the uh, so a peg plus or a highball is just we call them uh, Christian and I call them x plus y's. So so it's it's something stronger with something to dilute it and attenuate it. Um, and there are you know one million of them. There there's because the, that combination of things is just you know. Uh, Scotch and soda. That's a classic one. Um, or a peg, which is, we were just talking about, a great example of a peg is a Cure Royale, um, which is uh, cassis plus a sparkling wine. Um, the sparkling wine is cold, so it's not a room temperature drink, but it also doesn't have, it's not like ice down. Many X plus Ys actually include ice. And uh, one of the things I've said for uh, another thing I, I repeat ad infinitum <clears throat> is that, you know, the like time and water are two very important uh, ingredients in cocktails that we don't always talk about. The time that, uh, that the thing sits, is going to sit on the ice, the reason that it gets made the way that it is made, and of course the, the water itself and how you're, how you're delivering it into the the beverage so if you're shaking it or if right. you're or if you're building it on on ice you know um everything every, every choice we make alters the shape of the drink that comes out of it um so that's pretty simple that's a pretty straightforward thing i'm also i'm not other examples if you look at the if you have the handout if you downloaded it um a stone fence which is um apple cider plus bourbon, um, which is delightful. I love it. It's one of, it's, you know, it's a, it's a classic, it's a classic combination. Um, gin and tonic, um, the peg, which we talked about before, a queen's peg or a king's peg, uh, specifically uses sparkling wine instead of bubbly water or soda or even a flavored soda. Now, um, I always love to have when I'm building a drink, when I'm building drink lists, I always put on at least two, uh, two highballs because they are, because they're great. They're, you know, they're, they're refreshing. They, um, in terms of ticket times are, are, you know, they don't take any time to build. Um, and you know, they're accessible. You know, people, it, it, they don't, they don't generally include a ton of ingredients that people don't know what they are. That being said, the thing about freedom within rain is that you could break down that strong part of your, of your, um, your highball into as many constituent parts as you want to. You can make things as complex as you want or need to. Uh, I prefer to do more work in the back of the house in order to make my highball actually like a two-step thing so that's just, mm -hmm. just my personal choice what's um, an example of, of so, something you've done that's like that um i've been working for a few years with uh sort of like dialing in uh the methods for doing fermented sodas so that we don't need to uh like I don't like the use like blop syrup in a drink and then like use the gun. I want to build the flavor through mm. fermentation, build such a nice flavor. Um, it just really shows off the ingredient itself. So like, um, what's in it? Oh, uh, what was it called? I can only remember the name that I didn't. Oh, okay. It was called the wild bunch. So it was, uh, Jennifer. Um, as the base plus uh, muscadine grape fermented soda. So awesome. like, yeah, there's a lot going on in there, but it's still like, and the soda was on draft. So like, it's literally two things together in a glass. Um, does a peg um, have to have, it does the, does the sort of weak component have to be carbonated or can it be a juice, I guess? I don't think it can, I don't, it's, it's usually not a juice. Um, I 
most of the recipes I know and what I'm and what I've seen are it usually is carbonated um, and and partially because it was developed in India and by means of you know like being a refresher for people who are hot and um, I don't really have my words this morning I'm discovering while I'm talking to you and I know it's not morning but it feels like it to me um, <laughs> um, my well, I'm thinking of like a stupid example, which is basically like a Cape Cod, right? Or a screwdriver. So it like, I guess technically. It technically, yes. An X plus Y, you know what I mean? It's yeah. this plus that equals, yeah. So I'll go, I'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> agreed. So uh, I'm going to move on to punch because punch is such a large a large category um and as we know uh most of us know punch comes from the sanskrit word panch p-a-a-n-t-c-h which means five and kind of refers to the five uh you know the five parts um and uh here's my handy dandy little visual aid most of us know this uh know this this by heart. There you go. Um, Slightly more centered. Strong plus weak plus sour plus sweet plus spice equals punch. Um, and right. So yeah, those are the five yeah. things. Yeah, the five constituent parts. They can take many forms, but you know, they're that's that's what they are. Um, so you could, and and when you think about it, like like most of the things that we uh that we make that are sours are glasses of punch right even like a collins or uh like uh you know your basic sour um <clears throat> a ricky a daisy a margarita a crusta which is one of those things that uh christian that was the other thing that christian said when he stumbled out to talk to me before i started was don't forget to mention the crust in punch under punch because okay uh, we got it because <laughs> yeah uh wait there's more it's one of those zombie drinks right that that i was talking about like the ones that don't really have a life too much so that they're like yeah you know, explain they, they, explain zombie drink because i think that's really funny <laughs> and, but uh, you, uh, so, you, like, you can make an assumption on what that means but i think uh, you should probably define it <laughs> of a zombie the drink um itself uh, uh but like zombie drinks are the are like sort of the the ones that died and have kind of come back to life a little bit so you know like so a sidecar is a crusta right that's the one that we all know the best um but when you think about a crusta versus like a uh, daisy there's not a huge difference in in that recipe aside from the little splash of like bubbles that goes on the top of your daisy right um so uh i'm actually going to make a drink for this so um let's do it it is called it is called Abraham lincoln anyone who's <laughs> <laughs> anyone who has seen the movie um will will remember the quote if she were the president, her name would be Abraham Lincoln. Um, so uh, this is a fancy sour. Uh, I call fan. I, that's my. I sure that there are lots of names for this specific. You know, like sort of baroque, a baroque sour. So a sour where your maybe your weak ingredients or uh, other portions like you've sort of broken off everything so that there are more ingredients in the drink than just, you know, spirit, citrus, sweetener, something bitter and a little bit of spice. So um, this is made with a blended scotch. Um, my little Mies bottles here. This is all that's left of the Aperol in the house. Um, Aperol. Um, <laughs> Absinthe and lemon. So 
All and, of the recipe and lemon is what? Lemon juice. Oh, so, okay. Right I thought here. you said lemon thyme, and I was like, I love lemon thyme. <laughs> um, I don't know how that math works in my head for this drink, but um, so it's an ounce and a half of famous grouse. Three quarters of an ounce of Aperol. Okay, so what do you consider your Aperol in this case? Is this is this part of your strong or your weak? This is part of, actually it's part of your bitter. Uh-huh. Slightly okay. bitter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so three quarters of an ounce. That's a little heavy. It's my first day. Um, a quarter of an ounce of absinthe. I know I'm doing this backwards. I can't help it. I don't know if it's because I'm left-handed or what, but I know I'm supposed to build from less, most exp less, least expensive to most expensive, but here we are. Um, and half an ounce of creme de mure. Uh, and uh, I don't uh, want to assume that no one, that everyone knows what creme de mure is. So if you don't, it is a, uh, it's a blackberry liqueur. Um, mm -hmm. And, Three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. So that's your sour. That's my sour. My sweet is here. The, this is yeah. these. These are the I was say the and, and, and these are the bitter. Mm -hmm. And that the makes spice. Sense. Um. So ice. Ice is important. looking for the perfect glass. I am looking for the perfect glass. And of course they're all buried at the end of the line of glasses because, because that's the way life goes. Cause this is kind of a big drink. So. Am I even on the right line? I am. <laughs> Can you tell that also we like Nikki Burris in this house? Yes. <laughs> and the musical part. Do you have multiple sizes of Nick and Nora in there? We, yes, we do. Yes. <laughs> so. Beautiful color. Yes. And I had a panic attack last night because I had a bottle of Aperol in my like in my little bar area to the to the right over here and I and it had magically disappeared I assumed down Christian's throat at some point um and then I like went <laughs> throw him under the bus like shit I have to like I have to go to the I have to go to the liquor store before this thing tomorrow and then I uh went out into the garage and like went through all of our little like cheater bottles that we have out there from various bars and projects and found this, which was a lifesaver. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, it's, it's a glass of, this is a glass of punch. So cheers guys. I wish I could actually have someone else drink this. Yeah. So um, tell us, tell us what it tastes like. <laughs> we can't taste it. Um, tastes good. Um, it's, uh, so the, like the top, the top notes are really the, um, the Muir and the Aperol. And then underneath there's a bunch of, there's a lot of like the, the scotch is the, is the, is the bottom note in the cocktail. Mm -hmm. So, and it kind of spreads out across your palate that way. And when you breathe out, you really pull out the Muir and the absinthe. 
-hmm. It's only a quarter of an ounce of absinthe, but as you know, absinthe goes a little bit, a little dabble do ya. Um, Generally you know, all you need. You're just, <laughs> unless you're just looking to, go, to get somewhere, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. All right. So now we got we got two down. Did you want to talk a little bit yeah. about some of the history of this? Of punch. Um, yeah. Oh, here's another book for you guys to go out and buy if you don't have it already. Uh, Dave Wondrich's book on punch uh, came out a few years ago. Now it is brilliant and great. Um, and full of information on the development of punch. Um, sort of the way I've looked at, the way I kind of think about, the way I look at the development of cocktails, if you like read down the timeline on this uh, handout. So like you've got, you start with sangaree, which is like a kind of a wine based punch with a stick in it. Um, and Sort of move down to Limmer's Punch or the Collins. Um, as as you, what what I feel like I see as I'm looking at this is the way that we bartenders work when we drink. We we try something, we have something the first time, and we think about it for a while, and we're like, you know what? I think I think I can do this better than you can. You know, like frequently. Um, you know, like. Someone's like, I, I would like this way better if it had blah in it. You know what I mean? Like, and that's how, that's, that, that's one of the ways that we sort of get, get our, cre our, our creativity going. Um, I, oh, and I didn't make a, I mean, and yeah, the fizz, the fizz thing, um, which is kind of like a fizz is like, glass of punch that's also an eye opener which is i feel like the whole that was another category that we like thought about but don't it really falls under punch which is the idea that um of an eye opener which is sort of the hair of the dog from the night before like something to like maybe you woke up and you don't feel too good and yeah you know you need a little bit of protein <laughs> and a little bit of what happened to you last night and some sugar you know, so you put like a beer with a raw egg in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, like, or what they used to call like a pearl. They would drink back in uh, like one of the things that kind of the old fashioned uh, sort of developed from. Um, so I feel like the history of punch is so complicated that I can't go through it quickly. Um, and I feel you like you don't have to go through it all. I, just, I think yeah. it's actually just to know that the history of punch is just this it's very complex and that even though punch well i guess because punch has these sort of five constituents that it is right. actually very simple be you know there's one million combinations of ingredients to get you to that five pillar you know end solution right so you know just to say that right. the category is probably one of the most diverse historically and today yeah, it's hugely diverse historically and today, and it continues to develop because uh, the the category of sour is such a popular, you know, beverage. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, and a note on our current, because this is much on, I assume, everyone's mind, probably as much as it is on mine. Um, I am one of the things that I'm really fascinated to see is how we all manage to um, sort of fabricate these glasses of punch in safe, in safe ways to serve uh, for the next year and a half before, you know, we can always be face to face with our people, you know what I mean? With our guests. Um, so, I mean, like I'm working on solutions for my own bar, but I'm fascinated to hear what other people are doing too. It's one, it's one of the only reasons I'm on social media right now, to tell you the truth, because the rest of the time I can't take can't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. so like the super little intent. Uh, sure. from, again, what'd you say? Oh, I just said it's a little. Oh, intense. For sure. No. Yeah, it is. Uh, I had to take Facebook off my phone. Um, but like, uh, like I like work. I've been working like with the super juice that they developed over at Bar Expo. You know, as a way of 
cutting costs and like maximizing production and stuff like that. Just like, like that's part of our new job of our new job as bartenders, right? Is figuring out how to make sours and things that people want to drink uh, in, a, in a means that costs us less, but still is beautiful and delicious. So just, you know, I know that's not appropriate to this conversation, but I think it's, you know, it's the elephant. In the room. So, um, We'll move on to Toddy and Sling. Uh, Toddy, um, uh, it comes from the word Tari uh, for from like a rock, which is a spirit um, that was originally served uh, at room temperature um, and sort of as a simpler version of punch. Um, a rock was really uh, is really uh, a, a, an unusual flavor. It's not something that maybe everyone. Uh, likes on first consumption, and when the um, English uh, were in India and first, you know, tasting local hooch and things like that, um, they needed to fix it. That's kind of how punch developed. Also, it's just like I'm going to add a bunch of stuff to the stuff that I can't drink as it is. You know, like so I'm going to put some citrus in it because there was citrus in India. Maybe I'm going to put some tea in it because there's a lot of tea down there. Look at all these spices in the spice market. You know, like all of that stuff, sort of. That's kind of how it developed, and then they brought it home to India, to England, with them. Just to backtrack for a minute and talk about the history, I said I wouldn't talk about. Um, anyway, um, uh, toddy and sling. Uh, sometimes a punch. Sometimes a, a punch can be a sling because it doesn't have any citrus juice in it. So a toddy or a sling is really like, um, you know, like. Oh wait, here's my thing. It's <laughs> yeah, show us, give us your visual. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Oops. There we go. There. So Slightly more centered. Yeah. Spirit. Back up a little bit. Okay. Back up a little bit. There Spirit you go. Water. Like, Spirit um, plus water. You can put toddy or sling. Yeah, it could be. It could be. And you know, sometimes so the there's a sweetener in it. Sometimes Sometimes there's a sweetener, sometimes there's not a sweetener, sometimes there's, it's, a sling can be a room temperature drink, you know, a toddy is traditionally hot, you know, because of the toddy stick that they were using to heat up the water. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, but it's, it's its own little category of, of, you know, hot or cold beverages and a blue blazer, I think is one of the most famous of those, you know, I'm not going to do that today um Damn. i like my, i like <laughs> very I like disappointed my, i like i mean it's not much it doesn't look like much actually it looks like a lot but uh but uh but it is home and i would prefer not to burn it down this morning um i would prefer you yeah. not burn your home down as well but you know i do love a good blue good. laser i mean it's like the the next best thing to flare yeah <laughs> Somewhere in between. Yeah, I mean, flare is is stirring two drinks with one hand. That's what I. That's what I. That's my flare. You know, like it's, that's that's where <laughs> that's pretty much it for me. I'm gonna clean my tins really quick. I uh, wish I was coordinated enough we'll... to do flare. Honestly, <laughs> I'm just not actually yeah. coordinated enough. To do many tricks or any tricks. I think if I ever, I don't think I could ever throw a tin consistently with the confidence of catching it. So it just would never be a good move for me. But um, I actually right. do think flare is really great. I just wish it, you know, wish it was more of a thing. I think it's really cool and it's, and it's, you know, it's hypnotic to watch. Uh, and there is a lot of practice and skill and like those guys work, those men and women work really hard to be able to do that. And that is hand-eye coordination that I do not possess also Same. so clean my tins and come back and make another cocktail i'll be right back <laughs> <laughs> okay so the toddy right. and sling well that you were so right. fat I, I my it's it's not a long kitchen <laughs> uh yeah the toddy and sling i'm not actually gonna make a toddy i'm gonna make a nog um but i mean I don't know what else to say about that other than that it was in fact an important category and people drink them now. I mean, you, I don't think, 
I've never been through a winter in a bar regardless where I was in that bar, where that bar was that like I haven't made or put a toddies on the list. Sometimes there's just a whole list of toddies um, um, <clears throat> because they're so comforting um, and they're not overly strong. You know, the water is there to attenuate. So, so it's not just hot booze. It's, it's um, the water attenuates. It actually brings forward the flavor, the heat, you know, brings forward the flavor, especially as it enters your, your nose. Um, and I don't know what else do I want to say about sling. I don't know. I don't know because you know, like a Singapore sling isn't technically a sling because it has. Well, I guess it is. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to move on to eggnog. Um, eggnog is uh, everyone associates it with Christmas, uh, but it's it is closely related to toddy, but it's basically. Um, uh, it's kind of a more nutritious toddy because it it has egg and sugar. Well, as nutritious as sugar is, we, we sometimes need it, um, and dairy in it. Um, it has a nutrient value, let's say. <laughs> it has a nutrient value, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's typically made in the winter. Um, I'm going to make a variation on uh on an eggnog um which is one of my favorite drinks that uh that 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 we've done um partially because of the way that we came up with it um it has only the egg white it doesn't have the egg yolk in it um and it is a non-dairy it's a non-dairy nox so i'm using uh, almond instead of dairy for it um, so I'm breaking all the rules, but that's the thing. Once you know the rules, you can break them and still legitimate and still like argue your way through this being a nog. Um, okay. I, was like, way, I think you're breaking all the rules, but okay, let's go with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the rules. Uh, but, uh, but it has, I mean, if you consider the, here we are, I'm back. There it is. Okay. Back up slightly. There you go. Spirit egg, dairy, sugar equals a nog. Got it. Yep. Um, so a few years ago, uh, we were running a bar in Philadelphia called uh, Emmanuel. Um, and I was, we were working on the list and we, it was kind of like a, gon we called it a gonzo cocktail closet kind of what it was because we just sort of got weird with the cocktails and it was very small um so so it was a gonzo cocktail closet so i wanted to make this 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 drink is called the kid purdue and um kid purdue is a character from gravity's rainbow um by thomas pynchon and i wanted to make a drink that tasted like a madeleine so um, sometimes like that's the way I come at, at drink development, you know, like developing a cocktail. Like I want it to, I want to, I want to replicate the flavor of this thing that I, that I really like in liquid form and without actually using the object itself, the item itself. So um, the, the, so I was working on this recipe, um, which basically, which ended up as a nog because, um, <clears throat> Egg white, as you know, as it emulsifies, uh, sort of smooths off the rough edges of flavors um, and marries them together. Um, so I, uh, so it's it has bourbon, orgeat. There's your that's your that's your sugar and your and your dairy component, um, and egg white. Um, and a vanilla tincture, um, which is basically just vanilla tincture. Um, so I wanted to make a drink that tasted like a Madeleine. Um, and we were talking about Madeleines and why I wanted to do that. And then we started talking about Proust, you know, and Proust wrote, you know, Recherche de Tom Perdue, where there's that, that famous scene in that book where he 
uh, where he, the character eats a Madeleine and it takes him back in time. Um, so, uh, so he ha he eats this Madeleine and he's immediately like taken back to his childhood where he was eating Madeleines. Um, so at which point Christian says, we should call it the kid Purdue, you know, from the, Tom from the Thomas Pynchon. So, so it's a, it's a Pynchon, it's a Pynchon Proust mashup name based on a cookie, right? That's what that is. is okay. So in a, like so cerebral, uh, no one is going to get that except for you. <laughs> but that's just a testament to your intelligence. <laughs> I think it's great. It's like one of the best things. I, like the way we reasoned through it was one of like I enjoyed that so much. And once we came to the came to like like so every time someone ordered the drink, I was like, yes, I would love to make you that drink. You know, like because it was just <laughs> I was just. Tiny victory. Um, so vanilla tincture is just vanilla, basically. I make my own vanilla here, like a lot of us do, I think, at this point. Yeah, same. Um, so here's my, my vanilla, just a bunch of beans in do some you use a, um, do you, I was going to say, do you use a neutral base or do you use a, an age spirit? But you answered that for me. Use rum. I usually use a white rum. I like it. I like it with white rum. Um, so there's the vanilla and oh, the wild turkey. Two ounces of wild turkey. Not dry shaking this. I'm gonna I'm not reverse dry shaking this. I'm just shaking this. Any any particular reason? Um, I have have been reading a lot. I don't know if you can hear me talking while I'm doing this. Hang on a second. I was taking the bar, the bar five day a, a couple of years ago, and Dale DeGroff was telling the story about how the double shake developed. And I was listening to it the way you do. Um, and I was just like, huh, because uh, you can look it up. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but basically it was uh, something that someone was doing to uh, because they had hurt their shoulder and <clears throat> they didn't want to have to shake it as long as the egg white drink, as long as they normally would. Um, for this drink, I mean, it depends on what you want your drink to look like. Um, uh, for this drink, it the texture, whew, all the way up to the top, um, the texture and the, <laughs> and the flavor is, is just fine. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> That's probably pretty gratifying for you to be able to do. <laughs> um, although it is garnished with lemon zest. So this is the Kid Purdue, the most meta of all cocktails. Um, <laughs> I was like, that's the most postmodern cocktail we have ever managed to manufacture. Um, so this was the spice. Where is the spice component? I'm just trying to think of like traditionally you normally put like a grated nutmeg or something on the top of it. Oh, I guess maybe orgeat. I mean, almonds are a nut. I'm going to argue. It doesn't have a lot of spice to it because the flavor that I'm reaching for is so, is so um, quiet. Like the flavor of a madeleine yeah. is, is, is quiet. It's like something, yeah. yeah, kind of melts in your mouth and uh, lasts a long time. Like the flavor lasts, but it's not like, it's not, it's not, I find nutmeg, 
I like nutmeg and it has its use in many, especially classic cocktail preps. But for this one, it just didn't, it stepped all over everything because, you know, between the egg white and the orgeat and the, um, the vanilla, like it's just a really subtle, you know, cocktail in spite of its, you know, weird, weirdly bombastic name. Um, so, so there's your nog. Um, not a classic nog, but the point of really the point of this class was, is to talk about like how we, how once we know what to do, we can break the rules and make it work and still make it fit. Right. So, um, right. Um, it's the, it's the part where you learn it's knowing and being able to back up your miss, you know, like your, what someone else might see as breaking the rules or maybe not being the way something is supposed to be done. Um, I'm perfectly willing to be argued down at any point. You know what I mean? Like if you have, yeah. you have a different, but, um, and, and, and if I think you're right, I'll agree with you. But if I don't think you're right, um, <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I, I love eggnog, actually. I like to make eggnog. Eggnog for me, especially every Christmas, I, I will I put out an eggnog list with like five eggnogs on it. Um, just everything from like a vegan eggnog to like a classic like Baltimore eggnog um, because uh, it is such a comforting thing and it's something that we have grown, at least especially in this country, like it's part of our of our tradition of cold weather and holidays and things like that. Um, this what one, is a however, Baltimore is like, eggnog? Do I know what that is? The Baltimore eggnog, let me see if I can remember. The Baltimore eggnog is cognac and Jamaican rum. Um, I would. So <laughs> a split of cognac and, and Jamaican rum, I believe. And then we have one that we developed that um, is that we call the Kermit Roosevelt um, because Kermit Roosevelt loved bourbon um, and port. So uh, so it is uh, made with bourbon and like a ta like a ten year tawny. Um, one of my favorite eggnog. One of my favorite eggnogs is is Morgenthaler's eggnog from Clyde Common with uh, tequila and sherry. That is a great combination in, in nog. Um, when it comes to vegan nogs, I tend to get really weird because I'm just like, well, it's not going to taste like a nog. And, you know, it's not going to. We're make I'm making this for you so that you, can, extra, right? I want you to feel. I want you to be included right in this thing, but right. it's not actually going to taste. Like, it doesn't have eggs and it doesn't have milk in it. And 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 like. And and so like the the you could use aquafaba that gives you a texture. Um, I I like using coconut milk and whipping coconut milk, you know, uh, to make to give it like the fatty texture that you want in a nog. Um, but I tend to like go crazy with my flavors because I'm already using coconut milk. So like I go like with Indian spicing sometimes. I made a pina colada one. A few, a couple years ago, you know, because the, you're already, you know, you're already sort of veering widely from the path. Like you might as well just lean into it, you know, and make it taste good. Um, so, uh, so that's my. Yeah, luckily also. there's a lot of good stabilizers out there at this point. If you're trying to make a vegan, a vegan situation, just like xanthan gum and and you know, aguafaba. Yeah, exactly. yeah. coke all of that together, put it in a blender, <laughs> you know, there's a way if you're willing to do enough or need to do it, um, which is great because to your point, I never like leaving people out. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I, and, if there, and if there's something that we can do that makes like, that makes someone who feels maybe marginalized, for, uh, you know, in terms of food or beverage culture or at certain times of the year, if, we, if there's anything that I can do to make them feel more comfortable, then I'm going I'm to do it. You know, uh, it's uh, the, you know, one of the, <clears throat> the other reason that I would develop this class actually was because I, um, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm, I'm running low. Okay. Uh, 
Um, one of the reasons I developed this class Cocktail. is because once we, yes. Okay. Moving on. Cocktail. Also known as the old. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's the cocktail. It's the drink that gave its name to the whole category of, that ended up giving its name to the whole category of mixed beverages, um, mixed alcoholic beverages or non-alcoholic beverages, I guess. Um, the current uh, thinking is that the name came from uh, uh, something they call gingering, which is when you have an older horse and you're trying to uh, make it look younger so that you can sell it. Uh, you can do a couple of things. You can file down its teeth or you can, um, you can uh, uh, also, right when you're about to present it, you can take a piece of ginger and I don't, there's no nice way to say this other than shove it up the horse's butt. And uh, which understandably causes the horse to prance around uh, with its tail up and, uh, <laughs> and uh, with perhaps more energy for the ginger was inserted, right? Um, so, I'm just, uh, yeah. I just didn't see you going there with that, although I should have seen it coming. I just, I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, it's so far. Uh, uh, so <laughs> considered drink, uh, the category was kind of an eye opener, right? An old fashioned or a cocktail is kind of an eye opener, a little bit of sugar, the hair of the dog that bit you before, some bitters to, to like gentle down your stomach, you know, um, and water in the form of usually ice. Um, Although you can drink a cocktail hot, you could make you could put all of those things in a in a mug and add hot water, and then you have a hot cocktail. Um, so there's your ingredients. Everyone knows this. Lots of people have T-shirts that basically have this on it. Um, so spirit plus sugar plus bitters equals cocktail. And dilution. Um, yes. Your water plus ice. H two O. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The. Uh, and lots of people, I think, um, I mean, I feel like it, the cocktail is a, is a very loose garment and, and you can really, you know, you can go to town with design in terms of that. I know I have to move quickly, so I'm going on to Julep now. Um, um, yes. If anyone has more questions as we're moving through this at a good clip, uh, you can email me. They'll put up my email address on the screen and you guys can get me. Um, or, or on just Instagram. Have compliments or, your <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so the julep uh, is uh, it's a julep. It, it it encompasses the cobbler, the smash, and the swizzle. Initially made with spirit and sugar and water and an herb. Um, the smash is kind of a quick julep. It's shaken and it's meant to be consumed quickly. A julep. Um, built in a in a metal glass in a metal cup, so that you can you know sip at it as the ice melts, diluting the the whiskey or whatever you made your julep out of. I love a cobbler. A sherry cobbler is one of my favorite things in this world. Um, uh, I just love sherry though. So uh, you, anyway, you give it to me. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> just hand me the bottle. We're good. Yeah. Um, I mean, a sherry uh, cobbler is just delightful because it's basically, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's still just sherry, but it's colder and with snacks. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the perfect beverages and, and like, and you can change your snacks seasonally, you know, like yeah. I was doing a seasonal Spanish place that I was working here and we would just change, we would change what, you know, we always put a little piece of orange down into the bottom to start building, but like we would change what we were making it with. So strawberries in the spring or maybe a spiced syrup in the summer, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, in the winter, like warming spice in the winter and a heavier sherry. Um, it's just a really lovely vehicle for, for a delicious wine. Um, okay. Moving on. Manhattan. Manhattan is, oh wait, we didn't, well, okay. Here's the julep. I'm going to sit back down. Julep. Spirit plus sugar plus ice. Tulip. Yep. Manhattan. Spirit plus fortified wine plus bitters. Um, we named the group after the Manhattan. We think that's the oldest one. Um, originally made with rye and uh, vermouth. Um, but that 
that garment is also loose fitting because technically a bamboo cocktail is a Manhattan, right? It's just a, it's just right. a, it's, it's sherry instead of something stronger. It's a session Manhattan or there's a reverse Manhattan where you have more, you know, you've got more vermouth than, than spirit. Um, uh, uh, basically we think because of phylloxera, you know, uh, people started drinking fortified wines because of the phylloxera epidemic. Um, so the quality of wines that they were able to get was not as good as they were used to. And one of the things that people did in the, the, the development of and popularity of fortified wine was that you put stuff into the wine to make it both last longer and taste better. So botanicals go into the wine plus some uh, unaged brandy to fortify it, to extend its life and to, uh, to, to change the flavor. Um, there are 1 million variations on a Manhattan, uh, including the ones that we all know, you know, like the Martini, which is a variation on a Manhattan, the Martinez, the Gibson, you know, there are, I have a bar Bible that I, that I'm continually working on with recipes and the longest section is the Manhattan section because there are, because we've all made 10 different Manhattans maybe that we think are good enough to, to, to keep. Um, uh, so that's my short spiel on the Manhattan because I want to get to the Negroni because I'm going to make a Woo! Negroni. Um, and, and, and because as you know, Jessamine, when, when we were talking the other day, I told you that every day when I am done at whatever time that is, when I am done, uh, if I'm cooking dinner, if I'm not cooking dinner, when I'm like, if I'm talking to my friends on zoom or whatever, and it's just like, I'm not going to be working anymore that night I make myself a Negroni every night unless I'm And we sick. thank you for that. <laughs> what? <laughs> thank um, you for that. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, um, and I, uh, we have a complicated theory on the Negroni and uh, we, the argument that we had with, uh, with the, the kids we were talking to last summer was that I really think that in order to be a Negroni, it, the, the, the balance is important. So it has to be one, one, one. I don't want one and a half hours. An equal part girl. And I think equal part cocktails are among the harder things to, to like design and balance. Well, um, and I also think that each, uh, we were talking about it like if you consider a Negroni as a three-legged stool, um, each part of the Negroni, that's gin. Um, I'm also going to do something that you might think I'm crazy for. Um, I would love to show you my, in my refrigerator, I have a whole door full of fortified wine. Um, and uh, I'm going to make this Negroni with, uh, Mart with, with Martini and Rossi, uh, sweet vermouth. And the reason that I'm doing it is because of sort of the three-legged stool, the way that I think of the Negroni, because each part of the Negroni works to support the other part. And if the vermouth is too loud, then it throws off the balance of the rest of the drink. Um, and the, and yeah. I verify I can't verify this. Uh, I think it was, I, I prefer it with Cinzano, but I live here and I can't get Cinzano. So this is, this is, I, I made, I, I made Negronis with several other really good, really delicious vermouths that I use for other things that just threw off the balance to the point where I was like, I don't like this. I don't want to drink it. Um, so because this is maybe a less viscous, thinner, less botanical forward vermouth, um, it, it does its job a little better as, as each part of this, like serves to do the three things that you need to do, which is attenuate, you know, uh, dilute and balance. So, so like you have gin, the gin, which works as an attenuator and an intensifier of flavor, the vermouth, which is a dilutant and a sweetener and the Campari, which is a sweetener and a bittering agent. Right. Mm -hmm. So all three of those things work together. And if you move, if you lengthen one leg of that three legged stool, you can't sit on it any longer. Right. Um, it doesn't right. function as a chair. So that's my argument for the equal parts Negroni. I'm going to make one. 
do you think that the combination of the gin and the vermouth being the sort of the variables has a real true impact on the finished flavor profile of different Negronis? Like you choose your sweet vermouth intentionally because of which gin you pair it with, or do you choose the sweet vermouth because of the yes, overall balance? I do, like, I do use a specific like London dry gin. Like I'm making it with a London dry gin. I'm not making it with an American gin. I have lots of wacky mm -hmm. opinions about stuff, but for some reason when it comes down to this this particular cocktail i mean i'll make a million variations on it uh i have a, a white pineapple negroni on uh, that's going on a list that i'm working on now but this one like my negroni that I make for myself at home is very very classic your grandmother's this is your grandmother's negroni um so anyway i might actually drink let's this make one. your grandmother's um, negroni <laughs> So an ounce of Campari. I'm building it on a large piece of ice here. Move these guys. Building it on a big piece of ice. Um, and I'm going to pump my, oh, that's not even where that goes. Um, one ounce of martini and rossi sweet vermouth and one ounce of london brighton I'll, I'll just put that anywhere um <laughs> and uh i will tell you that uh i got i was really None of us live, none, none of us are going to live forever. Uh, I was really torn up uh, when, uh, when Gary passed last year. Um, I think that's when I started drinking a Negroni every night. Um, and I do uh, actually mix my Negroni with my finger. I wouldn't do this for a guest, um, but this is how I make it. Um, I don't Very put a twist good. on it. Oh, yeah, he uh, he was a special guy. And at one point, when before he came out with his for with his like with the hardcover Negroni book that he wrote, he asked us to write. He asked me if I would write something for the first one he did, and I actually ended up uh, writing a poem uh, called Nine Ways of Looking at a Negroni," which is based off of a Wallace Stevens poem called uh, Seven Ways of Looking at a Blackbird." Uh, but anyway, I actually wrote, have written a poem about this cocktail. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> so it's one of the poem with us. I feel like we need a poetry reading right now. I'll read it if you want to hear it because it's pretty hilarious. Um, I have. We, I think everyone wants to hear this. All right. <laughs> I was afraid that when I brought this up, that is what you would say. Um, I actually but secretly knew I was going to, so. <laughs> um, and I am a closet, you know, writer of poetry. Um, let me find it. There it is. All right. Nine ways of looking at a Negroni. Are we ready, guys? We're ready. Okay. One. She lifted the, gliss, the glass to her lips, russet, burnt umber, and carmine alternating quietly. Two, as evening ran into morning, we gazed drowsily at each other over the rims of our glasses. Three, 115 degrees in the shade, your lenses fogged as we stepped up to the bar and told the barkeep we wanted them on ice. Four, incidental music, a concert, sonorous merging equals one stirring note. Five, night burdened with pollen and approaching rain creeps up the side of the tower. We sit drinking in the half light. Six, he thought he was a cowboy and drank to prove it. Seven, in its first breath, we were sweet, followed by momentary bitterness and a very long finish. Eight, Gray light leaking through, dawn, through drawn curtains, sketches of Spain skipping in the corner, two coupes on the coffee table. 
Nine. I got up last night and watched the shadows grow while I listened to you breathe. That's it. That's a lovely poem. Now, People are very proud I feel, of the poem. <laughs> now I feel weird and awkward. I'm going to move on to my big bombshell, uh, which is uh, Carry on. here's the story. The story, and we'll wrap up with this because, like, I told you about how we came up with the eight categories. As I was like getting ready to do this presentation this morning, um, I was walking down the hallway, and and the the bedroom door comes open, and I hear a voice go, "Hello," and Christian, uh, who many of you know, uh, comes stumbling out uh, with his like squinty eyed, and like you know, he's sleeping. He's still asleep technically like in his he's talking to me in his sleep and he goes and he opens the door and he goes hello and I said yes are you okay <laughs> he goes and he goes there are nine <laughs> there are nine categories <laughs> and then he says go on this is a quote this is a quote he says room temperature we've been marginalizing the the Pousse cafe <laughs> But I feel like and, that's what you're talking about. Fair. <laughs> it's, and and you know, and then I stopped and I thought about I thought about it and I was and he was like, Yeah, because uh there's the scappa, so room temp cocktails are are a thing. Uh lots of bars are making them. I remember that uh the Franklin Mortgage and Investment Company when uh Al and Colin were still running it would usually would generally have like a, a room temp cocktail on. We ran a scaffa on a lot of lists. It it's it's not for everyone. It is a layered cocktail, um, but it's not a Pousse Cafe, which is several layers of cocktail. Um, and if you consider uh, the bars where you perhaps uh, are going to drink layered shots, right? The Pousse Cafe is alive and well and living somewhere in the wilds of wherever you are. It's a it 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 lives in the world and and. That was and 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 hence now I have to change the name of this class and start over. <laughs> nine. Um, nine. And Christian thinks that we should call it the only nine left alive. Um, <laughs> the only nine left alive. That's good. So uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's what I have, guys. Uh, thank you. Thanks for. Yeah, thanks that was for really great. I. I... <laughs> Well, I um, everyone has said really nice things in the comments. Um, are especially appreciative of your poetry and um, also the white pineapple macaroni <laughs> sounds really amazing. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on this. I think uh, I think you know there's a there's a million ways to kind of break down the cocktail categories and and historically and how they've morphed over time and what they are now and. And I just think that, you know, that that was a really fun deep dive into into some of the past and and kind of how you look at menus today. I mean, I think really to bring this back to to like what it how it's useful for some of the people that were viewing this is that understanding how these are all constructed, I think, really, um, really contributes to building a balanced menu. Right. Uh, you were alluding to it in the beginning of when you sit down at a bar, you look at a menu and you kind of take stock of it. But I think that like, that's really what you're doing. You're, you're categorizing the cocktails um, and looking yeah. to see, is there something for everybody, you know? Yeah. And, so. and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that was my purpose. So I'm glad that that worked and thanks for listening to my nerdery. Uh, and it was a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks yeah, and, um, Thank I you. think they're going to put Phoebe's email. If you have any questions you want to follow up, she made this really great Google Doc um, that is in the comments. Uh, it's, I think it's pinned, so you should be able to link to it if you weren't following along and you want to kind of revisit it later. It's got a lot of really great information in there from like the historical dates of when things kind of came about. You'll see some familiar cocktails, maybe some unfamiliar cocktails, but it's a, it's a really wonderful comprehensive document. So I, I suggest giving it a read. And Phoebe, thank you so much for putting us all together and sharing your poetry with us. <laughs> it was really interesting. And uh, I hope to see everybody back here again tomorrow and also on Thursday for some more learning. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Yeah. Bye.